Welcome to Child Care Rockstar Radio. I am your host, Chris Murray. Child care leaders around the globe are breaking through challenges, leading the way in innovation, testing new best practices, and impacting children and families in a much more powerful and positive way than ever before. Each week, join me for interviews with early childhood leaders and experts that will leave you inspired to become the next child care rock star. Now, let's go. Is the financial side of your business taking you away from what you love about it? Honest Buck frees you up to get back to the business you love and grow it. Honest Buck Accounting is your full service accounting partner. From payroll to forecasting, from budgeting to tax preparation, they offer a variety of services to meet your early childhood business needs as it grows. Their experienced team comes alongside your business to free you up and help you thrive and to show their support of early childhood businesses they are awarding a deserving center or school a $1,000 scholarship. Visit honestbuck.com forward slash Chris Murray. That's honestbuck, B U C K dot com forward slash Chris Murray, K R I S M U R R A Y, to register your center to win the $1,000 scholarship. Thanks, Honest Buck. This is episode 72 of Child Care Rockstar Radio. Welcome back, everybody. It's Chris Murray here with you. And episode 72 features Ron Spruenberg, the amazing CEO and co-founder of Hi Mama. And Ron has been uh, featured in our podcast um, in the past, and I've been featured on his podcast, The Preschool Podcast, twice. And we really have a great connection and relationship as thought leaders in the early learning space. I know that you're going to love this episode. We talk a lot about the COVID-19 crisis and some stats from Hi Mama's benchmark study. And we talk um, about what Ron has seen as a software provider in the space for large multi-chain sites, including kinder care, uh, franchises, franchise organizations, as well as small uh, single center sites. And his clientele runs the gamut across our industry. So we talk today with Mr. Ron Spruenberg about COVID-19 trends and what you can still do to come out of the crisis uh, the most successfully and financially um, viable as possible. So in this episode, Ron shares five things that you should be doing to Um, solidify your success coming out of the COVID-19 crisis. What can you do now to set the stage, plant the seeds, if you will, for success for your school as a leader, as a school leader? And so those five things are shared on this podcast episode, as well as the recent COVID benchmark study that they did and what was surprising from that study as well as um, things that we would expect to see and hear with regard to the level of closures and the the level of who's paying staff in full and how many folks are still collecting some level of tuition, how many folks are doing remote e-learning services, et cetera. So all of those numbers will be discussed and shared in this episode as well. We also talk about financial strategies and success for how ideas for success and how centers can remain financially viable and what you should be doing to uh, project your financial position and what you can be doing to add uh, other streams of revenue into your program, not just traditional tuition, uh, and how to get started with that. So it's a very, very rich episode, and I know you're going to get a ton out of it. Here back in the home office here in Carbondale, Colorado, I am very excited to announce that one of, uh, I've got several dreams that have come true over the last couple of weeks. And I actually have a dream journal that I keep and I've got about 40 specific dreams, uh, goals written in my dream journal. And I follow the practice that is laid out in the book, The Dream Manager, by Matthew Kelly, which is an amazing book if you haven't read it. 
And it's all about how to identify your dreams and then manage the dreams of your people, your employees, and use dream management as a leadership skill to retain and ignite the passion of your employees and drive up the levels of employee engagement in your preschool. So The Dream Manager by Matthew Kelly. That inspired me to do my dream book. And then we are working on our dream books in the Child Care Success Academy, especially the Empire level. We have dream journals and we share with each other dreams um, that we have written down in there and how many dreams that we've actually accomplished. And so I recently have accomplished a big one, guys, on my list, which is um, a river house. So I have been wanting to live uh, on a Colorado river with a beautiful home on the river. I've been wanting, that dream has been alive in me for about the last 12 years and went so far as to buy a river lot back in 2014, but it was not to be. And so just due to circumstances, we had to end up selling that lot, did not build on it. And then we, uh, uh, found a river home. So my partner, Charlie, and I are combining households, and we have four teenagers. Among us, we each have 15-year-olds and 17-year-olds, if you can believe that. <laughs> Three boys and one girl. So we are, uh, as of July 1, we are officially combining households and into a beautiful six-bedroom, five-bath home on the river in in between Carbondale and Glenwood Springs, Colorado. So after July 1, you'll no longer see this um, uh, studio, if you will, this backdrop for our podcast. We are working on a new, very exciting, beautifully branded podcast backdrop and must have some sizzle and some cool design elements as well as being branded. So um, more to come. I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but we are working towards that. And as you know, we've gone to a weekly podcast format and we've also gone to this video um, element as well as our traditional audio podcasting. So you can find us at YouTube and you can find us on all of the podcasting platforms. So thanks so much guys for following our journey. We're up to episode 72 and we're very excited to drive towards 100 episodes and just keep going with this amazing radio show that is inspired by my love of radio. I went to school. Some of you guys might not know the story, but I actually went to college at Miami of Ohio for a mass communications degree in radio and TV. And I did actually have my own radio show a couple different times. I did in college as well as in Crested Butte, Colorado at their community radio station. Uh, I had a couple different programs with different formats that I DJed. And I've taken my love of disc jockeying, combined it with business and early learning and turned it into Child Care Rockstar Radio. So that's the history of the podcast, if you didn't know. So we're going to continue with it and double down on it and just have a blast with it. So I hope that you're having a good time with us as well. So I have checked off that dream in my dream book, the dream of the river house and um, excited to move on or around Ju July 1st. Uh, into our dream home and make it our own and enjoy the river every day. All right, let's dive in to our episode 72 featuring Ron Spruenberg, CEO and co-founder of Hi Mama. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. My guest today is Ron Spruenberg, the co-founder and CEO of Hi Mama. Ron, how are you today? And welcome back to the podcast, buddy. How's life? Thanks for having me. Um, I'm doing pretty good, all things considered. It's a little bit of a crazy world we're living in. I think I used the word disorienting the other day, which, um, you know, between uh, everybody, lots of people at least, uh, being at home every day. Uh, obviously, we're dealing with a global pandemic. Um, and then also we have... Um, you know, a lot of unrest happening at the same time. So it's a, mm -hmm. a bit of a crazy world out there, to say the least. Um, it's uh, certainly a year to go down in history. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that you are based in Canada, but remind us where you are located and or where you're sitting right now. 
Yeah. So, uh, hi mama, our company, we're based in Toronto. I'm also uh, been living in Toronto for a few years now. Uh, right now I am standing actually at my standing desk, um, cool. at home, uh, in Toronto. And I, I also have at home my wife and I have two kids. Weston is two years and nine months and Reed is nine months. That's uh, a handful of early childhood opportunities. So congratulations on all of those beautiful babies and toddlers. And we love that. Thank you. Um, So we first got to know Ron and more about the Hi Mama story back on episode 14, way back, almost 50 plus episodes ago. And we're thrilled to have you back. Um, Again, a quick review for folks that didn't listen to episode 14. Tell us a little bit more about your story and how and why you jumped into the childcare software game at Hi Mama. Do you want the short version or the long version? <laughs> well, we have a lot to talk about, so I suppose we'll take the, the shorter version. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, I, you know, I always had an entrepreneurial itch. Um, and you know, part of that was from my family history, uh, and part of it was I went to I studied chemical engineering at the University of Waterloo here in Canada, which is kind of like the MIT equivalent in Canada. And so there's quite an entrepreneurial startup culture there as well. Um, but uh, you know, uh, as many of of my generation with with uh, parents of their generation. You know, it's all about getting an education and a job. And so that's what I did. And I worked in, in business consulting for a few years, but, um, you know, that itch never went away. And uh, on top of all that, uh, my father had passed away. And, um, you know, anyone who's gone through that will know that, you know, the one way to, uh, you know, come out of that strongly is to try to have their values and their life live on through you. And, and for my dad, he was uh, a very, um, a very kind person. He cared about uh, others, no matter who they were. Um, and uh, he always had a sense of duty and uh, he lived his life in that way. And I wanted to start a business that represented a lot of his values in life. And so that was, uh, you know, the combination of that entrepreneurial itch and, um, you know, starting a business that had a social impact is what brought me to to Hi Mama and childcare, and and really it was, um, you know, so many stories we hear are organic uh, in terms of where people find themselves, but this was actually not organic at all. I went and I looked at, you know, what are all the areas where I could start a business and have an impact, and when I started talking to people in childcare, it became very clear to me that, you know, uh, a lot of folks uh, were looking for help. Um, and there was so much opportunity to help them, especially when it came to um, workflow operations and communicating with parents. And that's how we started Hi Mama. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious how long Hi Mama has now been in business. When did you guys start this journey? 2013, we started. Okay, so it's been seven years. And how many people do you have on your team now? Uh, we're 75 employees. Okay, wow. Mm-hmm. It's quite a success story. And one thing that I feel really sets you apart from other childcare um, management softwares or other parent communication apps is this notion, which I didn't know was fueled by your dad's inspiration of being a thought leader, of being a socially um, networked person that is leading your company in a, out in the forefront with your own podcast, the Preschool Podcast. I'll give that a shout out. And um, benchmark studies that we've partnered on and all sorts of things that you do to um, help the industry with content and thought leadership, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And so we're actually um, a certified benefit corporation or B corporation, which means that, uh, you know, sort of more officially, um, we are a for-profit business, but one that also seeks to have a social impact. And yeah, it's it's driven by, um, you know, a lot of, you know, what I had learned from my, from my father, as well as um, going to business school, actually, I went, I did my MBA at Harvard Business School. And one of my big takeaways from that was, uh, as a leader, not just a, you know, a political leader, let's say, um, but a leader of a corporation, it's your responsibility to uh, look after your community, your employees, your customers. And this is a trend that's only 
becoming more and more important over time. And so that was something that was really important to me and why we do a lot of those things to contribute back to, to early childhood education as much as we can. Well, that's an interesting um, statement. It reminds me of, you know, back where business as capitalism and where we've come from being that the primary motive of business in general is to make a profit. And what you're saying is now with businesses in the 2000s and into 2020 where we are, it's more focused on also just improving the quality of life and helping people and lifting everybody up that are your clients, your customers, your shareholders or investors, but especially employees, right? Complete, especially, yeah. yeah. So Com- that's completely. Yeah. But um, with one clarification, which is, um, which is the point I'm really passionate about is it doesn't have to be, or um, it, it, it can be and, and both. And, yes. and in fact, I think it's required. So, you know, lots of case studies out there. Um, but it, my point of view is social impact is good for business. And, you know, we've seen lots of cases out there, um, Volkswagen being one of them where they, um, purposefully cheated emissions testing um, in order to get their cars out the door. Of course, they polluted the environment. Uh, they lost trust with their customers, with their employees, and their stock market, their stock price tanked. And guess who was not happy with that? Their shareholders, right? So doing the right thing is is the right thing to do. And even now in the current climate, we're seeing that too, right? Uh, social media companies like Twitter and Facebook are getting a lot of pressure about uh, fake news and what they're doing about that. Um, and, you know, where there's news about, uh, you know, walk-offs at Facebook, you know, you have to have values and uh, as a company and as a leader, and, and it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, at Hi Mama, one of our core values is own positive change because, you know, nobody else is going to do it for you. You have to own positive change on your own, regardless of yep. your role or who you are. Yeah. yeah. I posted a little bit of a controversial post yesterday, but I was owning positive change about what's going on in our society here in the States and talking about my own personal story of being brushed with, um, with racism. So that was a risky thing to do, Ron, but I felt like it was an important thing to do because I wanted to um, be a voice and not be quiet any longer, even though, you know, it's tough because not to get all into it, but of course I believe in the work that police officers do and I want to support everyone at the highest level, but I also feel like I sometimes just important to speak out about your values and just having integrity. And um, so that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough thing right now, what's going on. And um, especially with regard to COVID and everything that we've endured since uh, early March has been quite something. I think it'll be interesting to look back on this time in history and um, hopefully we'll get some healthy distance from it and be able to look objectively at it. And also, you know, I'm hoping obviously that we find a vaccine quickly and we can move forward and not have um, any more or very, very few deaths um, quickly, like here in the next, I'm hoping six to eight weeks, but I'm an optimist. So I always like, go to the optimistic. That's why I like Simon Sinek, because he's an optimist too. But um, (laughs) anyways, enough about that. So let's talk a little bit about your, um, I'm going to talk to you about what you're seeing across your clients in early learning. But before we do that, I have a kind of a fun question for you that I have not prepped you for. It's a take on the fun fact, but it's going to be a COVID question. So what is the first thing that you are looking forward to doing when we are able to, um, I guess, kind of get back to normal or get on an airplane or do you have something on your wish list that you're like, the first thing I would love to do post COVID is X. Spend more time with my friends, I'd say is the one. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we can now go to the parks a little bit and get out into nature, which is, would be high, would have been high on my list too. So that one's Uh starting to get checked off, but yeah, just, it's been hard to spend time with friends with social distancing. Yeah, absolutely. Agree. Great. Um, Let's talk about the landscape of early learning regarding how businesses are coping and starting to emerge from this crisis, at least here in the States. And I know Canada is a little different um, and, and globally, but what are some trends 
and things that you can share from having worked with ECE providers over the last 10 weeks? Are you seeing anything that could be um, ideas or tools or strategies or tips that you could share? Yeah. Um, so f- uh, five things. Uh, first would be communication, communication, communication. Uh, if you're owner, director of a child care program, communication with your parents is so essential right now. Um, you can very quickly become disengaged with your customers, with your families, with your children, if you're not staying in contact. Um, it, it's more important than ever. Um, so I would say that is that is the number one thing. And, and, and there's a lot of reasons why. Um, one of them is, is just it's human nature. Um, but the other one is, you know, parents have concerns, you know, there, there are pro- child care programs out there that are going to be financially challenged. And if you're not communicating with your parents, they may be wondering, are, is my, our child care program have financial challenges right now? Are they going to reopen? Um, and, and when? And they, they want answers. And even if they, if, even if you don't have answers, it doesn't matter. Um, you just have to stay in touch. Um, the second thing uh, that we're seeing, which is really interesting, and I'm very happy to see, by the way, is um, let's call it, uh, the, the business term, uh, is decentralization uh, of decision-making or, um, stated otherwise teacher empowerment. So with, uh, something that I've always had a little bit of a challenge with in early childhood education is, uh, frankly, there's a lot of micromanaging going on. And, you know, when we talk about early childhood educators are responsible for the health and safety of children. So, I would presume out of that, that we have some level of trust in those individuals, uh, given how important their job is. But oftentimes when it comes to more administrative tasks and communicating and building relationships with families, there's uh, a a need for uh, a lot of oversight uh, on those things. But with COVID-19, teachers are working from home there's been a lot of decentralization of decision-making and saying, we've got to stay in touch with parents and keep them engaged. So, you know, you all do whatever you think is best and, and what you're comfortable with technology and, and, and with your families. And so we've seen uh, centers have teachers do all kinds of things. Some are using Zoom, some are texting, some are using Facebook. Um, there's some are showing up outside the parents' windows you know, there's all different things that you can do, but the cool thing is it's, it's, it's made teachers excited because they're making choices about what they can do and how they can build relationships with families. And you know what? Um, the response from parents has been, we love it. You know, we love seeing it. We love seeing our teacher in their house. You know, we've never seen their house before. We're always so afraid of what parents are going to think, but you know, we're all just humans trying to <laughs> battle our way through this. Um, right. And nobody, you know, everybody's, everybody's doing, going through the same thing here. Uh, the third thing is uh, creativity and innovation, a little bit of, uh, uh, coming out of the last one, but uh, you know, a lot of center, a lot of programs are getting really creative and doing cool things. Um, and part of that is the descent going back to the last one in terms of letting other people make decisions about what they want to do. And, um, so it's interesting to see some of the things that are happening. Um, we have, uh, here's an example of uh, one uh, center. They were delivering what they call busy bags with supplies for at-home activities, um, drive-through parades where the cars drive through from teacher to teacher. And then each teacher was reading like one page of a book. Um, so there's these kinds of things that you can do. You know, you obviously don't have to do that every day, but it's it's such a great touch point and you will be shocked at how much of an impact it has on the kids to see the teachers um, in that way. Um, The fourth is seeing a big shift in openness to screen time and remote learning. So uh, education generally has been very anti-technology and especially early childhood education. And, and, and this isn't a, a pitch as the CEO of a software company. And, you know, we've, been, <laughs> we've been having these conversations with thought leaders in the space for a long time. And, yep. and our view has been, my view personally, and our view as a company has been consistent with thought leaders in technology and early childhood education, which is if used correctly with the right balance and the right training, you should be having screen time and technology in your classrooms. Why? 
because you're doing your children a disservice if you're not teaching them about technology because just like you teach them reading, math, science, geography, technology is going to be a big part of their future, a lot bigger part than it has been of our lives. And if you're providing them an education, technology is part of that education. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's been shocking to see how quickly this crisis has expedited adoption of technology and early childhood education, which which I think is is a great thing. Um, And of course, I think most people can speak to how much they've come to appreciate technology in this environment of isolation. It's, It's the one thing that's connecting us all, um, right. you know, you could only imagine what this would be like without technology um, to do things like this. Um, and then fifth and, and last, uh, this one's actually really more of the obvious one, but just health and safety, you know, um, is gonna, is top of mind for centers and, and for parents. And, and of course that is obvious things like social distancing, temperature checks. But I would say that the point I would, reiterate on this one is focusing not just on what you're required to do from your government, but how are you going to differentiate? Because when parents are looking at options for childcare and they might reevaluate their options coming out of this um, because the world's going to be so different, they're going to look at health and safety and who's going above and beyond and um, providing really quality health and safety environment, including that communication to keep you Uh, comfortable with, you know, everything being under control in the center in terms of um, that health and safety Mm -hmm. aspect. Yeah. So those are great. And again, it's communication, 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 teacher empowerment and giving teachers choices, uh, creativity and innovation, um, screen time and remote learning, and then health and safety. And those are great, Ron. Thank you so much. Um, Have you seen any fun, innovative ways to use Hi Mama during this crisis that people, your clients have come up with, oh, let's use the app like this, or let's use it in a different cadence than we normally would. Have you seen those kinds of things that you might be able to share? Yep. So some of the obvious things we're doing are what I just talked about with health and safety. So we're doing like remote parent drop-off check-in, temperature checks and that kind of thing. But the big thing that we've done is, um, provided childcare programs with daily activity content to send to their parents and families at home um, through the app. So, um, and this goes back to the first point of communication, 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 Um, you know, more than ever, you want to be staying in touch with your parents. So we're having the centers use Hi Mama to send the parents uh, activity ideas um, for things they can do with their their children at home. And um, that's been uh, used by, a good proportion uh, of our, our child care programs. Um, and, and, but, and I would also reiterate the point of um, various means of communication because both from the uh, aspect of your teachers, but also from your parents, certain people prefer or it's easier for them to communicate in different ways, right? So um, I think Hi Mama is great in a portfolio of different communication tools. Mm-hmm. Like, like doing Zoom meetings, for example. Right. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about the um, benchmark study. So you did a COVID-related study recently, and you asked questions like, um, are you closed or open? Are you still paying staff? If you're closed, are you still tar- charging tuition? Do you Are you doing remote e-learning? So... Um, run down a little bit the results that you saw and is there anything that was, came as a surprise to you? Yeah. Um, so some of the things that uh, I think most people would know that are a little less surprising, but 96% of centers um, who were open uh, said, you know, there were parents that were keeping their kids at home and you know that might be because they're unemployed. Maybe they were not, um, confident from a health and safety perspective, what have you. Um, Also about half of centers had implemented remote learning. So um, even when, and even if they were open, so this is the other thing because some, again, enrollment's a bit lower. Some parents are keeping their kids at home. There's a a very uh, real scenario where remote learning continues to be something that centers want to do even when they do reopen. Um, what has been surprising is um, the number of centers that haven't closed actually is very surprising to me. Our survey showed about 25%, but I've heard upwards of 
um, 75% from some other companies and sources. Uh, obviously, it depends a bit where you are, um, mm -hmm. if you're in an area that's been affected more or less. Um, but I think the fact that that many have stayed open in this environment um, says a lot about how essential this service is. Yes. Um, the the second one that was a bit surprising to me was we we asked about children's development and over 40 percent of our respondents said um, they had noticed a children's development either stalling or regressing which is obviously concerning and again goes back to the point of it being critical that we get children back into a regular learning environment um, especially those children who might be um, in more from more marginalized communities, you know, this the opportunity to go into a child care program is essential uh, mm -hmm. for their development. Um, and the the last one is about um, preparedness. So uh, about 30% of centers had not thought about how they were going to prepare their staff for reopening and are waiting for guidelines from their local government, to which I would say don't wait. Um, <laughs> you know, I, the way I always think about uh, direction from the government is, you know, it's great when you get it, but you can't, you know, don't bet your business on waiting for the government and waiting for answers. You have to start doing it on your own. Yeah. Um, and it is very important to be prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I looked at your results from your study and I agree with you that, um, compared to your stat of 67% of centers that closed, we about have the opposite, which is, I haven't, we haven't done our study yet, but a, a estimating based on talking to clients, 67 to 70% of our, our clients stayed open. Now the majority of those are United States. And then the only ones that really didn't stay open are were mandates, which there were four or five states of the 50 that mandated closures. Um, across the board, no matter essential or not, and you know every single childcare center was mandated to close. So, vast majority stayed open, and um, so that was an interesting um, difference to the results that you got. But you, yours were was. Do you think it was roughly half Canadian respondents and half U.S. or what was the geographic profile on your response? Probably, set. probably closer to like 80% US, 20% okay. Canada okay. would be my guess. Um, and again, it depends on, it, it might depend a little bit on the profile as well um, in terms of like the size yes. um, of, of the, the, of the, the center. program. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the Is jurisdiction, you... the jurisdiction definitely has a big impact. Sure. Like in, in terms of where, where you are. Yeah, I guess it would be um, an interesting question with regard to family child care, because we do serve family child cares with our courses and things, but not so much in the academy. They're just usually set for larger businesses. So what proportion do of family child care is our high mama clients? Just curious. Uh, relatively small. Okay. I don't know the number uh, off the top of my head, yeah. but uh, it's sort of a pretty small proportion. Um, it's more, we service more sort of like one to five location organizations, but then we also do have companies all the way up to kinder care, which Big is ones. Yeah. You know, yeah, the, the largest, largest in the country. The, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and even within that, like the, the data is very different actually. Like even within some of the large childcare organizations, I've yeah. heard everything from them having uh, you know, 20 to 30% of their centers open to 20 to 30% closed. Yeah. So again, I think it just speaks to there, there's a, there's a very high variability across the, For across sure. Canada and the U S state to state province to province. Well, yeah. And so that's a trend that we've seen, Ron, is that because we have, um, a global membership across all 50 plus Canada plus other countries, it's been a little bit more difficult for us to, provide widespread strategies because everything is so localized. And so what might be good for one client in one set of circumstances does not work at all for another client that might even be the same state, but a different county, like Colorado, for example, where I live, there were hotspot counties that went way more to the closures and actually did close schools in that county 
but the rest of the state of Colorado stayed open. So um, to your point, very, lots of variability, which makes it tough as a business coach to try to provide a blanket of ideas and strategies. So we just kept pulling. We just kept, you know, going. Like, what can work for your specific, like, let's just keep keep digging, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, so it, it's challenging. But the cool part is that you can network with other centers and owners in your area. And that's what we advise is like, whether or not you're in our, our group or your group is reach out and make connections with people in the ECE community in your county, in your area, so that you can start building that local network. And um, we even had our Massachusetts group lobby the governor using the media and lobbying to get Massachusetts centers open faster and get a list of requests granted back to all of our Massachusetts daycare friends. And so that was pretty cool because they actually went into super activist mode and held hands and went to the, the state capitol and really like made their voices heard in a big way, which was part, it was exciting cool. to be part of. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's great to see, you know, part of the silver lining of all this may be, you know, we're people, more people are paying attention to early childhood education and childcare and how important it is, um, you know, in a time like this. So that's yeah. been a great thing to see. And hopefully that continues after this all passes. Yeah. Um, and then the other, the only other thing I would add in terms of advice there, you know, talking about every area being different is kind of going back to the, <laughs> the point before about government, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't in our control right now, um, including when we can open, what we have to do when we open, et cetera. And that's where, you know, I would just try to focus on what you can control, which is, yeah. You know, what's your plan going to be when you do reopen, regardless of when that's going to be? And there's a lot of general things that we can uh, implement. So, you know, especially if we're focusing not on the basic requirements of what we have to do when we reopen, but we're focusing on what's the best, you know, what's the best in class um, version of a post COVID-19 center and if that's what I'm aiming for and planning for, it doesn't matter what the government tells me I have to do because I'm probably going to meet those requirements. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to look out for best practices across the country, let's say. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the financial piece a little bit. So um, do you have a sense for how many centers are keeping their head above water financially versus really facing a complete shutdown? And do you have any ideas for how to help people um, on the financial side of the house? I mean, obviously it's see what your governments and states can be providing in terms of programs and the SBA and the PPP, but has anything else been shared across your group of, of clients? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the information of financial viability, there's a lot of conflicting information, I would say. Um, so, so a report out of NAUIC says about 65% of <clears throat> child care programs couldn't last a month without some kind of financial support. Um, and 25% and weren't, weren't sure. Um, in our survey, we found that 10%, about 10% of respondents were not planning to reopen their center. Um, even if they were allowed to uh, by the government. My, my kind of personal view based on the various information and data points that I have is probably like um, 10 to 20% might be at, let's call it like a critical risk um, where 10% of that is like, there's a decent chance they may not reopen and then call it up to 30% that is at some serious risk, but they can kind of get out of it. Um, and, and this speaks to not just the short term, but the medium to longer term, which, which um, you know, takes me to your next question around how we can help. And that's, that's where I have, would have the most concern. Um, you know, hopefully uh, folks out there that are running childcare programs have been able to reduce their operating expenditure as low as possible while they're not bringing in revenue. But when we're reopening with uh, potentially less enrollment due to child-teacher ratio requirements and social distancing requirements and 
greater costs uh, to support health and safety requirements. There's a big question about how you're going to do that. Um, frankly, I do think um, government funding in this case is very important. Um, and we've seen, a, uh, you know, bills come out for uh, 50 billion in funding in the US, um, which I think is great to see. And I'm, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that's going to come through and support um, support child care programs uh, as you know, it's, it is so critical to A, open up the economy and B, you know, children's education is the future of the country. And if there's any time um, to reiterate how important children's education is, it's right now uh, mm -hmm. with everything that's happening across the country. Um, yet, I will also caveat that point to say, ironically, um, back to my previous point about waiting for the government, <laughs> we should be assuming there's no funding. And if it comes through, awesome. We're all gonna mm -hmm. cheer really loudly, but I think you have to go under the working assumption it's not coming. When it's in your bank account, that's when you have it. <laughs> um, before then, you have to go under the assumption it's not there and manage your costs um, you know, as effectively as you can. That's what it's gonna be all about. Yeah. My one big idea to share around cash flow and financials during this time is to reach back to your clients that are still in your uh, on your enrollment rosters, but they're just not utilizing your services out of fear for their kids and have a conversation with them or at the very least do a survey and find out what you can do that they might find of value. We've got people doing nanny um, services. We've got people doing online preschool and e-learning for a fee, for a small fee to drive revenue. That is like a side revenue stream, right? So mm -hmm. there's all sorts of things that you guys might be not even realizing you could do. The sky's the limit on innovation, but parents are in pain right now if they've had a preschool or home for two and a half months. So how can we serve them in a way that they feel comfortable about? Um, or, you know, that they would find something of, of value that they'd be willing to pay for. So I think a little bit more entrepreneurial focus on what can we do that would drive some revenue our way and really getting out of the box um, could be helpful. And we do have clients doing that. We have clients yeah. doing online e-learning services to potentially new clients that they have never served in-house in, in the school before. Um, and we have people who are doing like remote teacher. It's basically a, you know, teacher on call show up at the home and who's been fully vetted, you know, with the, you know, they're symptom free and temperature checks and all of that. Um, social distance teaching in the home, like it's basically nanny type services. So there's a lot that people can be doing to um, generate those those kinds of things are set, you know are generating depending on the size of the program between five and ten thousand dollars a month um, that can like sustain you and really those things can really keep you alive yeah. for the short term you know so yeah, those would be some every, ideas yeah every dollar counts right now yeah. we've 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 seen some of that too in terms of the online classes the activity kits that can be delivered yep um, another interesting one we saw was um, some childcare programs partnering with a local childcare food provider. So instead of delivering the meals to the center for the kids, they would deliver the meals to the families. And I assume there's some revenue share with the, the yes. childcare organization. Um, and so there's certainly some innovative things that, that can be done there. And then the other point I would just really hit home on, which you talked about a little bit, which, which we're also focusing on as a company, uh, as, uh, as Hi Mama is in times like this, like, an extreme focus on your customers. Um, you know, your customers are your closest path to revenue, sustaining yep. your revenue. Um, and so again, just engaging with them as much as you can. And, and like you recommended too, just having an open conversation. You know, if you don't have a survey, if they don't want to come back, give them a call, just talk to them, ask them why. Maybe there's things that you can do to work with them to figure out a solution that's a win-win for everybody. Um, yeah. But you don't know unless you talk to them. Exactly. Yeah, great. So, um, what would is there anything that you would like to um, share with the audience in terms of 
either things that you're doing on the preschool podcast or anything promotional that you're doing at Hi Mama? How can people find you and learn more about Hi Mama? Anything that you'd like to just share about your company and how people can, might be able to benefit right now in um, connecting with you? Yeah. So we've been getting a lot of very positive feedback on uh, a lot of our content related to um, managing your reopening, remote learning, uh, the importance of communication with your families during this time. Um, And that's both, you know, we have articles, we're doing surveys, uh, which we've talked about a little bit today. We're doing webinars where we have thousands of people joining us. Um, Some centers are even making that mandatory for some of their staff because there's so much great information in those. Uh, We also have the preschool podcast, which is hosted weekly, which you can find um, on any podcast streaming service, namely um, iTunes and uh, Apple uh, podcast. And so and there's no cost to any of this stuff. It's all completely free. And, you know, this is part of our social goal is to, you know, connect you with the information that can help you be successful. Um, so I'd encourage you to go check that out. Um, also, um, if, you know, I, I have mentioned a bit about communication being so key right now. Uh, and also parents are going to be really keen to know what's happening with their children in this environment. Um, and, you know, I use myself as an example. I don't consider myself to be a helicopter parent by any means. I go, you know, we drop our toddler off at childcare and we're like, see you later. And he's happy and fun and, and it's all good. But you know what, in this context, um, you know, we're having serious conversations about sending him back. And mm-hmm. if we do, like I'm, we're, we're worried, you know, we're worried about him contracting COVID-19 um, and what that means for him and for us. And so, you know, having the health and safety aspects um, that Hi Mama can help you with, I think will be very important and a differentiator, which I talked about before, you know, your marketing has to change now and differentiating with things like regular updates on temperature checks and health and safety and sanitary uh, measures at your, your center is very important. So if you want to check out any of that, um, both the free stuff and, and do a, a demo of a program or check it out with one of our um, community members, uh, you can go to highmama.com. It's H-I-M-A-M-A.com. Great. Just like it sounds. Hi, mama. (laughs) And you guys can also check out the preschool podcast. I've been on there, I think twice, Ron. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Two times. And um, super fun. And how many episodes you up to now? We just recently passed 200. Wow. Believe it or not. Yeah. It's crazy. It's one of those things where you just slowly, you know, keep it up over time and it just keeps growing and growing. And we got a great, uh, great audience now. It's great. Really, really great. Well, uh, Ron Spruenberg, I love having you on because we have so many um, things to share with each other and with the audience and just the thought leadership component is great. And I love what you guys are doing over at Hi Mama. And we love having you be part of our Child Care Success Summit event and um, just, you know, still hoping that we can all be together in Phoenix for that. And um lots of prayers there that we'll be able to have larger group sizes because we were hoping for a thousand people and 50 exhibitor partners. So it's, if we have uh, you know, we can only have, if we can, if we have to social distance from each other, it's going to make it really tough to be together in Phoenix in a yeah. small ballroom with a thousand people. <laughs> Maybe we could make it work. I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to draw have... the circles on the floor like they're doing in some of the parks and schools now. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens between now and October. So like I said, I'm an optimist. And uh, we'll end it on a note of optimism here, uh, here at episode 72 of Child Care Rockstar Radio. Chris Murray with Ron Spruenberg. And um, uh, thanks so much, Ron. And have a blessed rest of your week and your day. And thanks for taking the time, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Chris. All right. Take care. Talk to everybody soon. Bye-bye. I hope you liked this episode of Child Care Rockstar Radio. If you did, please share it with someone you know and help spread the word to your friends in our industry and on social media. Child Care Business Success is my passion, and I'm honored to be on this journey with you. As a thank you for listening, I'd like to give you a complimentary strategy session with one of my certified child care business coaches who are standing by to help you get the results you seek in your business and in your life. 
To get your free session with a coach now, go to childcaresuccess.com. That's www.childcaresuccess.com. Take care and God bless.